Good morning. Welcome to Lighthouse this morning. As you can tell, the kids are up here. It's a lot louder today. Um, we're going to worship God this morning, and we've asked that our kids join us. And so I hope that you enjoy that as they sing out worship to God as well. The first song we're going to sing is It Is Well. And um, a couple scriptures that I read this morning I thought were fitting as I thought about worship. The Bible says in Psalms 34, verses 1 through 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And that's what we're going to do this morning. If you would stand with me as we sing, it is well. We're going to sing the first verse and the second verse right after that. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows out is nailed to the cross.
Thank you for singing that song with us. Another scripture I read this morning that I feel like goes perfectly well with that song. It is well with my soul. What does that mean? Man, God has saved my soul and I don't have a care about where my soul will go now because God has redeemed it and he is keeping it. In that same Psalm 34 at the very end, it says, The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. It is well with my soul. This next song is Honey in the Rock. God is so good to provide for us in the wilderness. When we're seemingly lost, when we're seemingly wandering, God has a plan all the way through. He provides. Sing this song, Honey in the Rock. Honey in the rock, water in the stone, and I'm on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Oh, how sweet, 
how sweet it is to trust in you jesus oh how sweet how sweet it is to trust in you jesus thank you for singing that song with us um i uh oh how sweet it is to trust in jesus this morning in sunday school class we were talking about um, you know, when we trust in people, it's because we, we, we've seen them do something for us. And we, I used the example to try and get the kids to see it, you know. I said, what if one of you guys were walking out into the street and there was a semi coming? And I said, and Miss Ann dove out and tackled you out of the way of harm's way. I said, wouldn't you, the next time you see her, wouldn't you think about that? Wouldn't you have maybe write a card to her on her birthday? Wouldn't you do something special for her? Wouldn't you feel and think and act differently towards her? And we read uh, Isaiah 53 where it talks about the prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ and how he would be pierced for our transgressions and how he would be crushed for our iniquities. And God has redeemed us if we have taken refuge in him and we can look at that chapter in the Bible and we can say, man, look at what God has done for me. And now how then am I going to live for him? Am I going to be compelled to live for him because of what he has done for me? This next song is Waymaker. And of course, it just reiterates everything I just said, how God is so good to us and he has provided the means of salvation and the sanctification as we live our life for him. Let's sing this song, Waymaker. about these words as we sing them. Let's worship God. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Turning lives around 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. much you know uh this is the this is the sunday be seated please this is the sunday we have our our little rugrats up here praise god and so we thought we'd have them get up there and sing with frontline this morning and uh did a did a great great job i love that song uh, way maker miracle worker promise keeper he is definitely all of the above and uh praise the lord for that it's time to take up uh the offering i want to share with you a blessing you know when we have all the buildings everything that we have around here that we have and you try to prioritize you try to keep things up you know try to stay ahead of the game uh uh, several families said hey pastor we want to um paint downstairs um you know uh, praise god larry uh rick did the lighting down there we want to uh paint down there for the children's ministry we'll buy all the paint we'll take care of it all and and boy it looks really uh great down there and then um 
You know, the carpet's been down there for about 18 years. Uh, somebody last week said, Pastor, I want to take care of that, that room, that big room, and um, pay for the carpet down there, donate $5,000. Uh, to do that big room in the hallways, and man, and that'll just about do it, uh, praise God. And then somebody texted me uh, later and said, hey, pastor, I want to give $5,000 towards the roof. Uh, I know we're going to need a new roof. I'd like to give $5,000 for that. I'm like, man, uh, what a blessing. Uh, so be, p- please be praying about that. We do need to make one repair right here that we're going to make in a, a couple weeks or so, and that needs to be done that we have like six different prices coming in uh, for the roof, but we're really thinking it's going to be right around $30,000 to replace that roof. And so we had it done in 2002 um, for $12,000. Talk about inflation, right? And so we're waiting for more of the prices to come in. So please pray about that. And if God would touch your heart to give uh, for, for the roof fund or something like that, that certainly uh, would be a blessing. And I'd like to tell you that's the end of it, but no, there's more and more and more. There's always something that we're going to have to replace, fix, uh, repair, all that kind of stuff. But thank you so much for being sensitive to the Lord. And thank you so much uh, for your giving for these different projects because they could never happen. I think about that scripture. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And uh, yes, he can. In spite of the economy, in spite of our church being here in the middle of nowhere, uh, God continues uh, to be the way maker. He continues to be the miracle worker. He continues to keep his promises over and over again. Ushers, would you come forward? We'll receive the tithes and offerings of God's people. And of course, we know this, God loves a cheerful giver. And so we should not give grudgingly or out of necessity, but give with a heart of love a heart of gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, thank you so much for saving our souls so that we would not have to spend an eternity in hell. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for adopting us, making us your children. And Lord, thank you for the promises in your word, Lord, that you will meet our needs and you know our needs before we even ask. Nonetheless, you tell us to ask. So, Lord, we ask that you would continue to meet the needs of this local church through your people. And thank you so much, Lord, for doing that over these many decades. And, Lord, I pray that you will just bless the offering this morning, the gift and the giver. And, Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank the Lord that he gives us opportunities to serve, and truly they are opportunities to be involved in the Lord's work. And again, ministry involvement is so important. God has gifted each and every one of us to do something for his work, for his glory. And what does it do? Well, ultimately, it just helps further the kingdom of Christ. It helps reach people. 
uh, with the gospel. And, you know, I like to think of it like, and it's not my original illustration, but uh, I've read it, uh, where it's like a chain, a link, you know. A chain has many, many links. So you think about lost that need to be saved, and many times in that process of them getting saved, many, many links of the chain. And so we can be a link in the chain to help ultimately somebody to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and there's no insignificant thing to be part of that link uh, that just helps lead people uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ through the ministry of the local New Testament church. We've heard from many, many different ministries. God willing, three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, three weeks from today, we're going to have a ministry opportunity uh, time for you um, to sign up. If you already are working in the nursery, we want you to sign up. It's almost too like a rededication to say, hey, I'm, I'm still with it. Uh, and so we're going to have some sign-up sheets in the, in the lobbies there in Rooks Landing uh, just for you. If you already are working in the ministry, you want to continue working in that ministry, you, you sign up. And then we're going to have meetings, and we're going to organize. And boy, I'm telling you, I'm so excited about this and just getting more and more uh, organized. Uh, we're going to hear from three different ministry leaders today. Appreciate John. He's going to be working with Joe back there, uh, help him with the ushers. Appreciate Joe. He's been uh, faithful for so long. And then uh, we're trying to build teams of people. So John is going to work with Joe and create an, uh, a team. And so John, would you share with us about some usher needs? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Brother Joe has been doing uh, the ushers for, I don't know, years. Um, uh, I'm going to start helping him just with scheduling and uh, just, you know, organizing that uh, ministry. Um, basically, uh, ushers, they're the, uh, the second line of greeters. Um, we're we're going to have door greeters, but the ushers are going to be, you know, to greet everybody as they come in. Also, um, ushers... They help with the seating and uh, help with any major distractions in the service, so help people find seats. And uh, obviously, uh, the ushers collect the offering each Sunday morning. And then also, too, like if pastor has the handouts like we've been having, um, the ushers would also uh, help hand the handouts out. Um, as far as the needs, we don't really have any, any needs for the ushers. Uh, but the, uh, the staffing would be uh, four ushers every Sunday. And um, the rotation, uh, I think right now, maybe it's every month or so. Um, hopefully, maybe we can get some more men sign up to be uh, ushers and uh, we can get you on the schedule. Um, and then uh, the skills for the ushers uh, is just you got to be punctual. Um, you just got to be, be here by about 1045. And then... Uh, Friendly is, uh, it's nice to be friendly, uh, you know, just be personable and friendly. And then uh, responsible. Um, if you're going to be, you know, if you're on the schedule and you're not going to be here, um, you know, just let me know or, or uh, you know, let Brother Joe know. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in being an usher and you're not already on the schedule, uh, see me or see Brother Joe, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very important ministry. Obviously, it's more than just picking up the, you know, taking up the offering. Um, and so I'm excited about having meetings and, and uh, doing even a better job uh, than we've been doing in all these different ministries. We have Rick. Where's Rick? I know he's excited about coming up. I've asked Rick to sing a song. So Rick's going to sing. For, no, I'm just kidding. But I appreciate Rick very much. Uh, he's here all the time maintenance, uh, things break, things need repaired, uh, projects that are going on all the time. Appreciate his heart, his spirit for all that. Um, most of you know me. My name is Rick Brennan. Uh, and this ministry is about maintenance of the building. It's a huge facility. Uh, we don't utilize it all because the economy has been closed, but it still has to be maintained. up with some 
programs on how to have a maintenance schedule so we don't miss anything, nothing falls through the cracks. Um, just want willing people to come in. You know, if you have some experience in maintenance or carpentry or things like that, that would be great. Uh, if you don't, you know, please let me know. Um, and there's always projects going on around the building, so we always lend a hand, like with what's going on downstairs. We try to get involved in that because there's a lot of stuff to do. Thank you, Rick, very much. I appreciate Rick's uh, faithfulness. And Just as much as that, I, expect, I, I uh, appreciate his spirit. You know, when you're fixing broken things around a church, you can really get frustrated with things, you know. Um, but I appreciate his, his good spirit uh, just to repair things, to jump in. It seems like we're always doing something around here, and, and Rick kind of gets sucked into all of it. And I uh, appreciate his good uh, spirit with, it, with that. No, Rick, and I think that's an awesome idea um, just to branch out and just help, help some of our widows, some people uh, that don't have the ability to even change an outlet, something like that. And I think that's a great thing, an awesome thing. And uh, who, who's next? Um, Ernie. Where's Ernie? Appreciate Ernie uh, very much. Ernie and Daryl are working with our finances now. And so appreciate them very much. Uh, Ernie. Hi, everybody. Uh, just here to let you know we could use a couple more people for uh, uh, to help with keeping the church finances organized. Uh, what we do is basically we uh, we count the offerings and we put the data in the computer. We drop the deposits at the bank. Uh, we have to uh, pay and record the bills, balance a checking account, and try to keep the paperwork filed and organized. So uh, if you're somebody that has uh, secretarial skills, some uh, computer skills especially, I know I'm Daryl and I are still kind of new. I'm struggling. I'm a... I'm a uh, pencil and paper checkbook kind of guy, so I'm trying to figure out all these computer programs, how to keep everything organized and, and uh, generate uh, reports for the, for the church. It's, uh, it's a challenge to me, so if you have any of those skills, that'd be great. Uh, we could use you. Uh, as far as like material needs, we're just basic, uh, basic office supplies. We use some rubber bands, pens, simple stuff like that, but we can get that pretty easily. But um, yeah, if you're a person who has organizational skills, secretarial skills. Uh, if you can count without taking your socks off, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be good. So, uh, but we'd appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate, appreciate all these folks uh, being willing to help with these different uh, ministry needs. You'll hear from some more. Um, I don't know if we're doing it on Easter. I think we're skipping a week. Um, but then we'll be hearing from other people after, after Easter. Um, that's it. All right, let's grab our Bibles, and we're going to go once again to Romans chapter number 12. We've been talking about uh, gifts that God uh, gives to his people. Today we're talking about the gift of administration or the gift of leadership. I, I'm so thankful throughout my life, throughout my personal life, throughout my church life, that God has lifted up um, leadership in my life, and I'm thankful for the leadership that we have here uh, in our church. Uh, it's very important to have um, the right kind of leadership, and that's what we're talking about today. Two different passages we'll look at, Romans chapter 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, 
but all of the members do not have the same function. And we've been talking about that over and over again. We're all different. We all have different functions. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. And then he goes on to mention these particular uh, what we call motivational gifts of prophecy, then let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in the ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, and then last week, he who gives with liberality, then today, he who leads with diligence. And so uh, the right kind of leadership will obviously have that, that characteristics of, of diligence, and then he show, who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, it says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So he repeats himself here, and God has appointed. God has appointed, and that's so important to remember that. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then after that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, and look at this here, administration, uh, which is leadership and varieties of tongues. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will uh, use the lesson this morning just to help us, Lord, just to see, Lord, what will you have me to do. Thank you for these different ministry leaders we've been hearing from every week. It helps us all to see just how much uh, opportunity we have to serve you here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. And Lord, I pray that you will help us as we look at this important subject uh, of leadership. And as it, it, all these gifts, Lord, we're not, uh, Lord, going to be leading uh, in certain things, preaching certain things, giving. We don't, don't necessarily have the, the specific gift, but, Lord, you expect us to do all of these things, gifted or not. But, Lord, you do raise up some people that are specifically gifted in these areas. And, Lord, because of these people answering your call and following those gifts, Lord, the ministry can... Lord, reach new heights and do more for the cause of Christ when people that have these specific gifts rise up and use them for your honor and your glory. I pray that you'll use this message as well. And Lord, if there's anybody here that's not saved, I pray, Lord, that they would trust you, Lord, even today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have um, a definition of leadership, the gift of leading or administration is simply this. It's the ability to rule, to lead, or to pilot. Think about that word pilot for a minute. And what you're doing is you're help, helping to guide. And that's what leadership does, is helps to guide. So it's the gift of leading or administration is the ability to rule, to lead, or to pilot. A great example in the Bible of leadership is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king, and of course, God raised him up to administrate or to lead the people back and to rebuild the wall. And, uh, and boy, with that uh, leadership, there came a lot of opposition, a lot of uh, trials and tribulations, and we'll get into that in a little bit. The best example is Jesus. Uh, Jesus, of course, is God, and Jesus left heaven. He came down to this earth. He was born, right, lived a holy, sinless life, and he gave his life. He was crucified for us, and of course, we're going to be talking about that specifically next week on Easter Sunday. And so Jesus Christ had the qualities of leadership. And what were some of those qualities that Jesus had as a leader? Let's look at them real quick. As a shepherd, he met the great needs of his followers. Leadership helps to meet the needs of the follower, help to meet the needs of the people. So as a shepherd, he met the great needs of his followers. As a shepherd, he showed others how to get their priorities straight. 
And you know, uh, Jesus was always talking to the crowd about priorities, about how this world is temporary and how we should not, for instance, lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust and thief corrupt, but rather lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So leadership helps us to keep our priorities straight. And as a shepherd, he led others to an authentic lifestyle. And boy, that's uh, an important word, especially in this day and age, authenticity, just to be real. People are looking for somebody that's real. And Jesus, of course, was very, very real. And he led others to be that way. And here's one of the main things Jesus did. Jesus showed that leaders are to be shepherds, not tyrants. And Jesus was that type of leader. He wasn't beating them over the head. Uh, He did correct when they need corrected. They were arguing over who was going to be the greatest. And of course, another time he asked them to pray. They did not pray. They kept falling asleep. And so he did rebuke them in some different ways. But he wasn't just lambasting people and uh, beating people up all the time. So leadership is really like being a shepherd. It's helped to to guide the flock of God. Very, very important responsibility that leadership has. And what are some attributes of leadership? Uh, Some good uses of leadership. And we're going to go through these. Right leadership helps to prevent disorder. You know, the devil (laughs) is the author of disorder. You know, God set up order in the Garden of Eden, did he not? And I mean, this was the order that God set up. And guess what? Who ruined all of it? Well, the devil. And you know, can we blame him fully? Well, no, Adam took the biggest responsibility. That's why we have Romans 5.12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so Adam and Eve, they were responsible for their own decision. But God wanted things orderly, and he set up things orderly. You think about, um, you study creation. This is an amazing thing. It's just a little side note. But you think about creation, and you think about God, and you think about uh, the order even the fact that on, is it, is it April 7th or 8th that the eclipse is coming? Uh, I think it's the 8th. Is it Tuesday, the 8th? Um, but anyways, this eclipse is coming. Now, how can, they, how can they tell us the exact time that this eclipse is coming? Why? Because the order. The order of God in the universe. It's unbelievable. You study the different ocean currents. And the book of Job talks about these things. It's unbelievable. The water cycle. The book of Job talks about these things. Thousands and thousands of years ago before science even discovered it, you know. But anyways, order. God created everything uh, in order. So right leadership will help to prevent the disorder. And the Apostle Paul talked about the importance of having this leadership. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 12, he says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. And admonish you. So Paul was telling the churches, hey, uh, God has placed in our lives leadership. Uh, It's not in my notes. I think it's Romans chapter 13. Very, very familiar passage. Uh, Obey them that have rule over you. God has put people in our lives. And boy, human nature is, and I'll I'll get to this in a little bit, but human nature is we don't want anybody telling us what to do. Uh, You know, I think about that that parable where, uh, you know, God sent down or or the the master sent somebody and and they just kept beating him up. and, 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 And then he said, well, surely they won't beat my son up. I'll send my son there. And what'd they do? Yeah, so that was, of course, a prophecy, too. But God was teaching us in that parable. We just simply don't like people telling us what to do. And we, we don't like in the flesh. We don't like to be uh, admonished. But what 
Leadership helps to prevent disorder. Right leadership in the church is crucial to keep things running in an orderly manner. And you're always going to have some form of disorder. You're always going to have maybe somebody that's not there, somebody that's missing, maybe somebody that didn't call and say they're going to be missing. And even if they do call, that you're always going to have uh, something, even, uh, even uh, not to tattle on you, um, Brad, but Brad came into my office and given me my microphone and everything. He says, oh, man, I'm kind of scrambling because they switched some things up on me today. And, and so, man, I want to make sure everything's right because they switched some things up. And but that's just the way it is uh, in real life ministry. But what do we try to do? We try to keep things running decently and in order. Those with the gift of leading, just a few attributes here. They have a desire to see things move forward for what? For the benefit of the ministry. They have a desire and ability to oversee projects, projects for the benefit of the ministry. So they keep looking at, hey, the ministry, the ministry. What's important for the ministry? You know, we all have our little areas that we like, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, I mentioned the painting downstairs. People like, oh, man, I'd like this done, so I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to do it. Praise God, you know. So as human beings, we have, a, we have a nature to what's important to me, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that, right, as long as we don't uh, stir up trouble <laughs> about things that we don't think are important because it's not important to me. Uh, but, you know, I think that's an amazing thing. God puts people in the church, and they each and every one Look at things the differently, things that are important. And because of that, the parking lot gets done. Because of that, the rooms get painted. Because of that, new carpeting gets put out. Because of that, you know, the roof uh, gets done. Uh, I'd like to remodel the bathroom. Way back when, somebody said, Pastor, I'd like to remodel these bathrooms. Here's $5,000. Guess what? It's still sitting in the bank. But guess what? Uh, remodeling those bathrooms is going to cost more than $5,000. So we could use a little money for that, too. But guess what? It's always something. It's always something. But praise God that people do have these, these qualities to say, hey, this is important to me. I want to help accomplish it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Praise God when people do uh, do that. Um, but anyways, have the desire and ability to oversee projects for the benefit of the ministry. Have the ability to break down major goals into smaller achievable tasks which help to keep things moving forward. Boy, I remember just talking to Ryan about the coffee shop. Boy, that coffee shop is something that I had in my heart I want to do for a long time. And so finally, one day, it was getting closer to fruition. But you know what we did? We sat down, got a plan. Well, here's what we need to do. We need to get different groups of people in here, break this up into small projects. We need to tear this carpet out of here, right? We need to tear these walls out of here. We need to, in, in the meantime, clean it up. Aaron, I don't know how many trips you made to the dump, right? Just hauling things to the garbage dump. But guess what? A big project, and, and I mean, it wasn't monumental, like, like building that gymnasium and all that, but nonetheless... You break it down into small parts, and it's just like this roof, you know. It'd be nice to do it tomorrow. If somebody wants to write us out a check for another $25,000, i will call the guy today. You know, I'll, I'll leave him a message. But you know what? What do we do? We do things according to when we can do them, how we can do them. And many times it's just here a little, there a little, you know, and there's some Bible principles there as well. But anyways, right leadership helps to prevent disorder. And boy, let me tell you something. Uh, Disorder is a natural event. So it's always a struggle. It's always a struggle. Think about your home. Think about your children. Think about your job. Nothing ever comes easy, right? It's always dealing with some kinds of problems, some kind of disorder. Anyway, leaders should be examples, obviously. Right? In a home, a husband's a leader in a home, he should be an example. Pastor, a pastor is a leader in a church, he should be an example. The Bible talks about that. And, and, and work, at the workplace, you have different bosses, supervisors. Well, they, they should set the example uh, for all the other workers. And it's, it's common sense, really, but it's also Bible. Uh, leaders should be examples. Uh, Peter talked about this, First Peter chapter 5. Verse 1, the elders who are among you, I exhort. 
I, of, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, right? And also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So he's given a little bit of his testimony here. Verse 2, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, right? God doesn't have us in a headlock, right? But willingly, not for dishonest gain or greedy or filthy lucre like the Bible talks about in a different passage, right? Not so it'll gain you personally, but for the church, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Look at verse number three. Nor is being lords, being lords over those entrusted to you, that mentality that you're way up here and are way down here, you're, you're some kind of a fancy lord. Not, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you. Look at this here. But being examples to the flock. And so God wants those in leadership positions to be examples to the flock. Um, our human nature always wants to put our own interests first. Do you know that? It doesn't matter if it's me, you, anybody. We're selfish by nature. The flesh is very selfish by nature. We want to put our own interests first. You know, Eve, she was beguiled by the devil. And really, what was he doing? He was, he was working on that part of her that wanted her to put her own interests first. Right? She didn't care about anything else. She just cared about herself, what she wanted. And boy, again, as I mentioned previously, we've got to be careful with that mentality. You know, uh, what do I want? And so uh, uh, human nature always wants to put our own interests first. Servant leadership is not about imposing our will, right? And that's what Peter was talking about. Being the right kind of example and uh, not our own thing that we want to do. And, and John talked about one particular fellow in 3 John. Um, 3 John only has one chapter, but verse number 9, a fellow named uh, Diotrephes. It says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. So you had... You had one leader in um, this church that wasn't an example. He was just out for himself, and, and he, he was causing some trouble there. But anyways, here's the third thing. Leaders have the ability to see the big picture. The big picture. And that doesn't mean other people are, are blind to that, obviously. But, you know, uh, you have the ability to prioritize things. Why? Because you see the big uh, picture. Uh, what needs done uh, first? <laughs> what needs done second? Boy, there can be a lot of uh, debate about these kind of things. Um, what should we do? Um, well, we need this done, this done, and this done, this done. And so what do we need to do in all these type of things? You look at the big uh, picture. Uh, pr helps you prioritize things. Look at this. When a project is given to an administrator right, or a leader, they're able to picture the completed task and what it will take to accomplish it. And again, I don't care if it's a coffee shop, if it's a gymnasium, a remodel in the auditorium, or, or Sunday school. Ryan's working with me right now to help just organize our Sunday school better. Appreciate it so, so much. And so what do you do? You look at it, and you have a, you have a picture of what it's going to look like. Wow. A picture of what it's going to look like when it's done. And that could go materially, and it could go spiritually, too. What is God going to do in that person's life? What's God's going to do in that family's life? And boy, you have a picture of the end result. And boy, that's a, a blessing. Um, and so uh, they not only see a goal, but they have an awareness of the resources and availability to reach the goal. Right? I know this is a pastor. Why do you think I mentioned uh, about can, can God furnish a table? in the wilderness. I mention that quite often. Why? I do it for me, but I also do it for you 
to realize, you know what? God is the one with all the resources. And sometimes when it doesn't even look possible, you realize, hey, you know what? God can do this. I think about the scripture with men, things are impossible, right? With men, things can be impossible. But with God, what? And I'm not trying to give you a rah-rah speech. It's, it's scripture. It's the truth. But with God, what? All things are possible. And boy, I tell you what, I've seen it time and time again in my personal life. I've seen it time and time again in the local New Testament church, how God can furnish a table so God can do some, uh, some great things. So we have an awareness of the resources. I, I, we don't have our head in the ground. Realize, man, our economy's not good, right? I mean, the interest rates are not good, all right? Uh, there's a lot of bad, but what do you do? You focus on those resources only? If you did, we'd never do anything. But what do we do? We focus on his resources. God is able to do it, right? Um, the heart of an administrator, the heart of a leader, has vision. And we know Proverbs, and we can debate about the application of that scripture, but where no vision is, what? The people do perish, so we must have a vision. And casting that vision, right, the big overall picture, for others to see, they can inspire great accomplishment. And what do you do? And again, this sermon isn't about me, forgive me. It's, it's not about me saying, hey, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching on leadership, so I need to puff myself up. It's, I'm just trying to give you some examples. Because right? I know, those of you that know me the best know, I'm not the best leader in the world. <laughs> I have so many, and I'm not trying to be humble, it's just the truth. But you know what, you see, you see things that need to be done. You picture what it could look like when it's done. And man, it's just amazing. And then many times you talk to an architect, and the architect helps put it to print. And then the architect puts it to print, and then boy, you know what, before long, guess what, you've got, you've got it. You see the picture of it in your mind, and it comes to life. And it doesn't matter if it's something outside with the outside or if it's something in here. And yes, we need to remodel this eventually, right? It's, that's coming too. Um, but anyways, uh, in casting a vision, I'll read it again, for others to see they can inspire great accomplishment. Vision is needed to help keep, keep people in focus. Very important. Here's another thought. Leaders get fulfillment and joy through the finished tasks and teamwork. I mean, man, when something's getting done and the people are, are doing it and, and working, man, what an exciting time. What a blessed a thing that that is. What a joy that that is. Leaders receive joy and fulfillment in seeing all the parts come together in a finished project. I always love our spring cleanup. It's coming again. And uh, we usually have just enough people. God always gives us what we need on those different work days. But man, when we leave at night, or, or sometimes it's just a couple hours later, a few hours later, it, you look around at the building, you look around at the flower beds, you look around at the, you think, man, it looks nice. Man, does this look nice, you know? And, uh, and man, and so what do we do? We look around and we say, man, it's all coming together. And by the way, it doesn't matter who gets credit for it. Uh, good leadership does not worry about getting credit for accomplishments. They see success as a collective achievement. It's people coming together, right? You've heard the cliche, and it's... it's, it's it's just a cliche. It takes a village, right? Uh, that can be looked at in a negative light, but I believe really it's a biblical concept. It takes a village. It takes people, right, working together, and that's what Paul talked about, working together, building together. Uh, it talks about in the book of Corinthians. And so, hey, not look what I did, but we say, hey, you know what? Look what the people did. The people did this. And boy, without so-and-so, without so-and-so, without so-and-so, without so-and-so, this would have never happened. And so what is it? Everybody coming together to meet a common goal. And boy, you know what? Uh, leadership gets fulfillment in that, gets joy in that, or should. Um, leaders have a willingness to endure resistance. 
Leaders have a willingness to endure resistance. Hey, rest assured, when you put your mind to do something, you're going to have resistance. Right? Nehemiah. God put it in his heart to rebuild the wall. Uh Uh-oh. Here comes the resistance from within and from without. Right? They work with a, a, a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. It's just amazing. You read what they did. But rest assured, you need to say, hey, guess what? There's going to come a lot of resistance from this. And you know what? In my own experience, whatever project, whatever thing you set your mind to do, there's going to be resistance. And I'm not saying ornery resistance where people are trying to be ornery, although that can happen too. But I'm just talking about satanic resistance. If you say, hey, you know what, man, we're going to organize the church. We're going to get these ministries in order. I guarantee you resistance. Resistance, problems. Man, we're going to organize this. We're going to streamline this. We're going to, I guarantee you, again, whether it's intentional or unintentional, there's going to be resistance. So what are you going to do? You're just going to quit. Man, no. I remember we were building that facility next door, and we had a million-dollar loan, right? And now it's down to 640000 by the way, if you're curious about that. Um, so a million bucks, and we were building that building, and we were running out of money. Oh, my goodness. What are you going to do? It's like the Bible talks about if you build something, make sure that you have enough to finish it because otherwise your enemies will ridicule you saying, look what they did. They started. Have you ever driven by a project and it's, it's, it, they stopped and you wonder what happened? I don't know, maybe the person died or maybe they got a divorce or maybe they ran out of money and you look at those and you say, what a shame. What a shame for them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, oh my goodness. What are we going to do? We can't borrow any more money. We, we're just, that's it. So we had a couple meetings back in the day. It's like, you know what, this is, this is it. We're, we can't get any more money, right? So we did that once, by the way. I'm thinking back now. At one time, we did need more money. You know how it is when you build a house even, right? Well, you figure building something for a million dollars, I mean, 10% is $100,000, or are you just going to scrape up another hundred grand, right? But you know what's amazing? You have meetings and, and talk, and it's like, you know what? We can do this. We can finish it. And guess what? By the grace of God, we finish it, but I got to be honest, barely. I mean, there's things that we'd like to have done. You know, you know uh, well, I'm not going to get into all that, but there's things that we'd like to have done, but you just don't have the money, you know? One of the things is that kitchen by the gym. You know, we plumbed it all for... For, for commercial sinks and all that. We didn't have the money for it. Uh, but God knows what we need. Listen to this, when we need it. But you find a way to get it done. And what are you doing? You're trusting God. And so you realize Nehemiah said, hey, God put this in my heart to do this. So God's going to help accomplish it. And boy, I love that verse. If God be for us, what? Who can be against us? And so, um, leaders, I'm skipping some stuff, okay? Whoever's up there, Brad. Uh, Leaders almost always face some type of criticism or hardship, just like Nehemiah. And boy, it's it's a challenge, but what do you do? Uh, I'm going to read this. It's it's not in your handout or anything, but um, you can, Abraham Lincoln, I know you've heard this in different variations. But Abraham Lincoln's famous quote, you can please all the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. Um, And that shouldn't be said out of orneriness, but that's just the truth of the matter. And then here's another thought. Leaders have the desire for new challenges. 
A leader is really never satisfied, nor should be. And so, once a goal is accomplished, you're ready to move on to something else. And I've said this before, it's like, preacher, when's it gonna, when, when is it going to, um, when are we going to be done with projects? Never. And I know that can be discouraging to some. But you know what? You're never done. Think about your house. Your car, everything else. When is it all ever done? It's not. There's always a project. Always something to do. Leaders are always ready to move on to the next challenge. So we have this challenge in our church. Hey, this ministry. Man, we want to organize, reignite our ministry teams. So we're going to preach about it. We're going to have people come up here and talk about it. We're going to put the tables out there, and that's going to be the end of it, right? Man, that's just the beginning. That, it's going to be an ongoing thing because of the devil, because of the flesh, because of the world. It's going to be a constant battle, a constant battle. Now, what are some dangers of leadership some dangers. We must all be careful with some of these things, include me. Because we can be guilty if we're not careful. When God puts us in a leadership position, whether it be a husband in a home, leader, a, a leader on the job, or a leader in the church. Um, these are in your handout. They're in your handout, but you won't see them on the screen. Okay? Um, we have to be careful to not view people as human resources rather than human beings. Using people to accomplish personal ambitions. But I want to be careful as a pastor, you know, about doing things just because you want to do it or per some kind of personal ambition to have a bigger building or whatever. Showing favoritism to those who seem most loyal. And boy, I'll tell you what, that's just that's something of the flesh. Just to show favoritism to those who are more likely to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. That's a danger. Taking charge of projects that are not God's direction, that kind of goes along with the other one. Delegating too much work to other people. Just becoming a taskmaster. Here's a very important one. We shouldn't overlook serious character faults just because somebody's a valuable worker. Or people have money or whatever. Being unresponsive to suggestions. Right? And that's part of it. And by the way, if you ever make me a suggestion, I, hey, believe me, it's not like I take it and throw it in the garbage. But you just put it and put it in its, try to put it in its place. You know? So don't be discouraged if you've ever given me something, uh, something on your heart, a thought, Right? But a leader shouldn't be totally unresponsive to suggestions or appeals for help. Um, and then this, a failure in giving proper explanation, right? Explain why we're doing this. Um, or giving praise to people. Because people do need praise. People do need to feel loved and appreciated. Very important. Now I want to finish with this Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Today's Palm Sunday. Um, it's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Think about this on a donkey. The people of Jerusalem, the Jews, were looking for a deliverer. Just like in the Old Testament. They were looking for a Moses. That's what they were doing. To deliver them from the Romans, just like Moses delivered them from the Egyptians. They were looking for a Messiah, not as far as spiritual. They were looking for a Messiah to literally get them out from underneath Caesar. Just like Moses got them out from underneath Pharaoh in the Old Testament. That's what they were looking for. That was their desire. Jesus had these amazing abilities to do miracles. He had all this power. And they were looking at him to solve their Caesar problem. 
to solve their um, political problem. But Jesus did not come to solve their Caesar problem. He came to solve their sin problem. And they didn't like that. They didn't see it. And so I, I do want to show you, it should be on the screen here, I think, Matthew chapter 21, verse 4. And by the way, let me just throw this in here. Let me encourage you to bring a Bible to church. Let me encourage you to open it. Now, I will say this. I love preaching with screens. Why? Because I can go fast. But let me encourage you. Bring a Bible to church and open it. If you, and you've got to be fast, especially now, right? And so we do put the screens up there, but I still think it's good for you to bring a Bible and open it in church. I've been meaning to say that for a long time, and it finally came out. All right, Matthew chapter 21, verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Zechariah 9.9, 9. this is what it's referring to. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went out and did as Jesus commanded. Do you remember what Jesus said? Go, you're going to find this donkey. It's never been ridden. And that's a miracle in itself, getting on a donkey that's never been ridden. But you know what? They went and they found this donkey. Just like they said, Jesus said they would. Just like the upper room where they had the Lord's Supper. Just like Jesus said, they found this guy. They had the room furnished. Same situation. You're going to find this donkey. Just tell the man, the Lord, the master has need of it. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. And set him on them. And that was respect. That's what they did to a king. Man, they didn't have a saddle, so they took their clothes off and put them on there. Out of respect for the king. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and laid them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Hosanna. What did they do? They laid their coats on the donkey. They laid their coats on the road. Right? What was Jesus doing? Jesus was openly declaring to the people that he was their king. And he was their Messiah. That they had been waiting for. But again, they had two different ideas of what that Messiah was going to do. <coughs> Hosanna, they cried out. They cried Hosanna. You know what that means? Save us. That's what they were saying. They were saying, save us. Save us from this Caesar, from this Roman government. Save us. They were so excited. Blessed is he who comes. Hosanna, those, many of those same people a week later were yelling out, crucify him. Crucify him. Why? Because Jesus wasn't what they thought he should be, what they were trying to make him to be, right? So within a few days there, Hosannas would change the cries of crucify him. So it's about, what is it about, Palm Sunday? The triumphal entry into Jerusalem as king. And that's what Jesus was and is. He's the king. Not only just the king of the Jews, but he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And one day he's going to rule and reign. I think it's important to be reminded of this today before we leave. Jesus Christ came not to conquer by force, Although many wanted him to do that. He came not to conquer by force as earthly kings do, but by love, grace, mercy, and his own sacrifice. He came to Jesus, he came to this earth at, and as a servant. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 talks about that. He became a servant. Jesus conquers not 
nations but hearts. He didn't come to conquer nations. He didn't come to conquer Caesar. He came to conquer hearts and minds. Let me ask you, has he conquered yours? Has he conquered your heart, your mind? Are you a believer? Are you a child of God? Right? His message was one of peace with God, not peace in Palestine. As a matter of fact, there's a prophecy about that. God tells us, he commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But guess what? There's not going to be real peace until the Prince of Peace comes down. And one day the Prince of Peace will rule and reign. His message is one of peace with God, not of temporary peace. You know what the people wanted really was just some temporary peace. But you know what? There's always going to be a Pharaoh. There's always going to be a Caesar. There's always going to be governments. There's always going to be oppression. Jesus wanted to fix something much deeper than that. Peace with God. And let me ask you this morning on this Palm Sunday. Do you have peace with God? Are you saved? And boy, if you are, God will give you that peace of God. When you have peace with God, with that comes peace of God. It's a peace that passes all understanding. And boy, what a joy, what a privilege, what an honor to be the son of God, a child of the king. And boy, you know what? Jesus had a plan. The people had a different plan. We went out from underneath Caesar, but Jesus said, I have a plan. I came to do the will of my father. And one week later, there he hung. He hung on the cross. But a precursor to that, Zechariah 9.9, he had to enter Jerusalem as a king. And man, the multitudes were there praising him and crying out, save us. But it was the wrong kind of save us. And so I hope you're saved. I hope you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's bow our heads. Maybe God spoke to you about something this morning. Is Jesus the king of your life? Does Jesus rule and reign in your life? Or do other things rule you and reign over you and so maybe you want to come down and talk to the Lord this morning take a knee and just show the Lord your humility and say Lord I need your help maybe you need to be saved if you have the courage come down come down to the altar sit in the front row and I'll make sure to talk